<clears throat> we'll move on now, um, put my glasses back on. Um, Madarima uh, Mukherjee is a PhD fellow at the School of Women's Studies in Jadavpur University. Uh, she began her academic uh, career with a master's of philosophy in comparative literature, um, but is now focusing on her uh, doctoral work in women's studies. She has been associated with a number of different projects at the school and uh, is currently working on a domestic violence project. She is going to talk about uh, some of her experiences uh, with women in West Bengal um, who are uh, uh, trying to escape violent relationships. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. Um, this is a part of a paper I'm writing based on the findings of a project of the School of Women's Studies, Jadapur University. Uh, the title is Women Negotiating Violence, Case Studies from West Bengal. The School of Women's Studies, Jadapur University, has had a long association with the issue of domestic violence. In 2009, the school associated with the West Bengal Commission for Women to build a database of DV cases under the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence, uh, 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 from domestic violence Act 2005, registered between 1st January 2007 to 31st March 2009 in seven southern districts of West Bengal, uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, areas where we were doing our field work, Kolkata, Howrah, North 24 Parganas, South 24 Parganas, Hooghly, East Mednipur, and West Mednipur. The data collection could not be completed due to bureaucratic problems. However, the incomplete study and interest to pursue the issue of domestic violence further provided an impetus to the school to undertake a project entitled Awareness Generation and Sensitization on the Issue of Domestic Violence in Kolkata. This project was conducted in the year 2010 and 11. In the course of the study, the project team conducted interviews with 120 women survivors of domestic violence, mainly those women who are in a violent conjugal relationship. The stakeholders of the act, such as the protection officers, service providers, counselors of the family counseling centers, and lawyers were also interviewed in the districts mentioned before. In this presentation, I shall briefly discuss how the aggrieved women negotiate violence using their familial and familiar resources before resorting to law, the kind of guidance, support, and aid they receive from the stakeholders of the Act, such as the service providers, the family counseling centers, protection officers, and lawyers. And finally, I shall highlight the limitations faced by these stakeholders while rendering their services to the aggrieved persons in need of critical assistance. Uh, this is the profile of the respondents. I will not go into the details. Uh, PWDVA has been looked upon as a pro-woman law. However, the study conducted by the school found women resorting to support networks within familiar and familial resources. When these sources fail to bring in the reco reconciliation, they resort to law. Firstly, because there is general ignorance regarding law for women. Secondly, legal language being quite complicated is not at all user-friendly. Thirdly, many women as well as lawyers told us that once the complications of law, Ainer Jotilota in Bengali, entered the conjugal domain, the equations of a relationship becomes worse. To begin with a case study, and I quote, my husband is ultimately my husband. He may be deaf, dumb, blind, but finally he is my husband. Where do I go without him? After marriage, women have no other place to, place to go to other than the Samshan Ghat. Behula had gone to Swark to bring her husband back. I have done every possible deed as a wife to bring my husband back to me. These are the lines quoted from an interview of a woman, 26 years old. She has been facing violence from her husband and alcohol having many extramarital affairs. The lines showed us the importance of marriage in the life of a woman in spite of being brutally tortured by, husband, by the husband through acts like beating, punching, pushing, and depriving her from her meals. 
Most of the respondents who have faced violence in one form or the other from the husband and in-laws still believe marriage to be indispensable in their life. This logic of dependence, as uh, Madam Cravero has mentioned in the morning, could not always be defined along the axis of economic dependence on the husband, since some women highlighting the overwhelming importance of marriage were economically independent. Across class, the importance of marriage retains its stronghold, and violence within marriage is legitimized and naturalized. In some, the ideology of being in marriage was very firmly ingrained. For some, there was no other shelter except for the marital home. So being in a violent relationship was a better option than being without any shelter. For some, the social stigma of being abandoned by the husband was greater than being outside a marriage which is violent. Being a divorcee is a stigma, kolonko, identified by many women. Dowry has been found to be a major cause of domestic violence in the case studies. Dowry in the form of cash and kind was easily given and taken among the middle classes and the working classes. Among the working classes, it is exchanged in the name of dowry or pawn, but among the middle classes, it is given in the form of gifts. This gift is in the maximum number of cases, a large sum of money which is exchanged during the time of marriage. Besides dowry, many women mentioned that they have been labeled as mad, bad woman, prostitute, girl from a slum, ugly looking, and these were identified as the additional reasons for the violence or the torture to continue. In maximum number of cases, as a first step to negotiate violence, the aggrieved woman tried to take the help of her natal family. In an arranged marriage, the power to seek help from the natal family is much more than in a love marriage, where the choice and the onus of maintaining a healthy marital relationship lies on the girl. Regarding help and assistance from the natal family, there have been mixed responses. Some of the respondents mentioned to us how parents had helped them mentally and economically to fight the crisis. But we see that around 60 4% in the sample of the qualitative interviews were economically dependent without any professional or remunerative engagement. Some mentioned an initial phase of support and then withdrawal of, the, of that support since she was dependent on the father economically. Not, however, not all cases have been this hopeless. A few women mentioned that they could come out from their violent marriages only because of the support that they had received from their natal family. The entire expenses of registering and continuing the divorce litigations had been paid by the father. However, we find that the siblings have never been supportive of their aggrieved sisters. A respondent mentioned to us that her brother and sister-in-law did not want her to stay in their family as a separated or a divorced aunt would have a bad effect on their seven-year-old daughter. Besides familial support, many women had taken help from the neighborhood club, the Mohila Shomiti or the women's organization, and some respondents also mentioned resorting to the help of the police, which again proved to be very ineffective. Many women complained that the police did not want to register a complaint at first, and even if they did, no effective steps were taken. Some women mentioned taking the help of NGOs, women's commission, the family counseling centers, religious and caste societies to mediate their problem and avail a pre-litigation reconciliation. Very interestingly, the state legal aid services in West Bengal, or uh, for that matter, uh, any state legal aid service is supposed to provide free legal aid counseling. Uh, However, we found that uh, they received cases only forwarded by other organizations and very few women approached them right at the very beginning. It was observable that women who visited the family counseling centers or the NGOs providing counseling services developed a relationship of trust and dependence with the individual counselors and also with the protection officers. Even after being in a violent marriage, the desire to carry on with that marriage and lead a happy conjugal life was present in most women. The women saw the help of the counselors or the protection officers as the only path towards reaching this end. In an informal talk, one of the respondents mentioned, P.O. Didi has said everything will become as it was. These words made us realize the trust which women had in these organizational and institutional posts. 
This trust and belief results from the hope that the husband would be reformed and would love the wife and stop all forms of torture on her. Now we come to the uh, stakeholders. The service provider NGOs are usually approached by quite a number of aggrieved women. They provide counseling service, they run shelter homes, they conduct awareness programs at various levels regarding various issues and are entitled by the PWDVA Act to fill up a DIR. The counselors of these service provider NGOs are the first to attend the aggrieved women. However, none of the counselors suggest resorting to legislation as the first step. Pre-litigation resettlement is the primary objective of the service providers. Like most of the aggrieved women, the service providers too share the ideology of keeping the family intact. The woman's problem is not addressed in certain cases and even it, if it is, that is to the extent of resolving the problem she faces within her family. The family counseling centers too reflected the same perspective. The service provider NGOs as well as the FCCs mention the helpless condition in which women come to them. The importance of support, help and assistance helps them to gain mental stability and recover from the trauma which as has been admitted by most counselors leave deep scars and take time to heal. The counselors from the NGOs as well as the FCCs mentioned that they develop an attachment with these women who come to them regularly and seek their help. Some counselors have admitted to going beyond their professional obligations and helping women with the limited economical resources like recharging their phone, paying school fees or tuition fees for the woman's child or paying for her tiffin. Our visits to the Office of the Protection Officers, focus group, group discussions and informal conversations also made us realize the important role they play in motivating the aggrieved woman. The woman look up to the PO for intervention and help to settle their violent relationship with their husband. Many women have said that their husbands fear the PO more than people from the NGO or the counselors since it is a government post and she is a government official. The role of lawyers becomes important when the aggrieved women decides to file a case. We found an overwhelming dependence of the aggrieved women on lawyers regarding le legal matters. The ignorance of women regarding matters relating to law and their legal rights had become very clear to us from a previous project on marriage which we had conducted in the year 2008 and 9. Each and every group of stakeholders, however, have their own problems. The lawyers attached to the legal aid services mentioned that money for dealing with cases under the PWDVA was disbursed only after the case was finally executed. Firstly, final execution took a huge span of time and secondly, the payment was delayed even after the final execution. The protection officers who are contractual government officials do not have a proper work contract. They lack a proper office setup in certain districts. Their salary, TA, DA and other allowances are quite irregularly paid. Their leave rules, transfer policies, regularizing their pay and increment are not addressed. Lack of funding is a common problem for all the stakeholders like the service providers and the FCCs. And in addition to this problem, the FCCs also point out a complete ignorance of the government towards uh, advertising their services. The secretary of the FCCs in West Bengal informed that the labor department of the government of West Bengal has recently mentioned in a circular that counseling cannot be defined as labor and therefore there is a lot of problem related to the allocation of funds. The other problem of low and irregular pay exists for the FCCs like for the other group of stakeholders. Some ambiguity also exists regarding the use of the term counseling. In the course of our interview, we came to know that unanimously every stakeholder was said to be doing counseling in the name of fact-finding or mediation. This devalues the process and importance of counseling. Counseling is a process by which a trained professional helps the person to reach solutions to her problem by herself. Grounded in emotional support, counseling is one of the techniques to help individuals and groups work out problems in personal, inter interpersonal and social functioning. We found that there is a conflict of interest among various groups of stakeholders. 
The counselors of the FCCs mentioned that they were also eligible to work as POs, though they have a similar and in certain cases higher qualification than the PO. And the PO mentioned that they can do counseling as they have studied counseling as a special paper in their MSW course. The FCCs mentioned that they can also act as service providers since they have been working with women's issues for more than seven years in the past. In conclusion, I can only mention that law exists to provide relief to women, but in a country like ours, with a huge pressure of cases in the courts, lack of awareness regarding laws, fear of judicial jargons and of the entire legal process, women leaning towards support networks for reconciliation is neither unexpected nor undesired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think those case studies are particularly informative in terms of really trying to understand the complexities and the difficulties that women face when they finally decide to come forward. And why we see that having the law, the legal framework is critical. Um, it is not uncommon in most countries around the world that the majority of women in violent relationships do not choose a legal route. They have other pri uh, priorities in terms of how they would like to see the situation in, um, resolved, and I think that these case studies from West Bengal um, illustrate the difficulty of that challenge. <clears throat> 